peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Let us worship God together. We begin by speaking into our presence, our brothers and sisters worshiping right this minute in Lava Ita. Um, in Lava Ita, they start the service in theory at 10, <laughs> but nothing starts uh, on time. Which, so that's another way in which we are sisters. Um, and so um, in Lava Ita, they are worshiping right this minute. They're also worshiping in Matanzas at First Baptist of Matanzas, where the women there um, have a ministry of um, art and they create uh, fabric art. And this is, uh, I'm gonna step over here, Jay. I don't know if, if that helps for everybody to see it on the camera so everybody can see the full length of it. But traditionally you wouldn't wear a white stole just on, you know, Reformation Sunday. But um, because it's brand new and I wanted to share with you, I wanted to wear it today. Traditionally you would wear a white stole at Christmas and Easter and weddings. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm wearing it today, hey, yeah. just because I can. So thanks to my sister for this, this beautiful gift. We want to speak into our presence others who are not with us, beginning, of course, with the Dodson family who are delighted to say that this is their last Sunday away. They will be back on next week. So we look forward to having them in our midst. Um, there are others who are not here. Would you like to speak those into our presence today? Dana. Dana is online, so we have Dana. We just miss your, your, you being present with us, Dana, but we, we feel your presence through the gift of technology. Um, Ann and Eddie, we miss them. And Jeff? Yeah. Oh, good, good. Kim and Stan. Kim and Stan. We miss Kim and Stan. And they will be back with us two weeks from today. So we will get to have them with us. So bringing all of those into our presence, we invite you to worship God standing as we sing our first hymn. 26. Number 26. Irma Foundation. you haven't gotten to see me for some of you 
uh, for a couple of weeks. I thought I would read the psalm today. Um, also, I forgot to ask anybody else, so there's both of those things going on. Mainly the, first, mainly the second one, not the first one. Um, so if you have your Bibles, uh, open them to about the middle, and we'll find Psalm 46. Psalm 46. Hear the word of the Lord. God is our refuge and strength of very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God is it when the morning dawns. The nations are in uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. <sighs> Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted among the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is our uh, tradition at this point to have some good news. And I have good news, but it is not in the way that we normally do it. And that is our good news this week is that we are home from a wonderful week in Cuba. Um, we were surrounded by love and blessings and rich experiences that have changed us in beautiful ways for which we are grateful. Thank you for the support that you gave us uh, all to go from our church were Jay, my husband and I, and, and Dawn Mitchell, who was online with us, my sister, and also Katie Bradley, Jerry's granddaughter, and Kim's daughter, and um, Mark Seiler, who is a friend of Ecclesia, who is uh, a part of uh, Circle of Mercy Church, uh, went along with us. And of course, we joined there Kim and Stan, who guided us through everything. And we picked up along the way Tamara and Lacero Sabalas, who accompanied us to uh, Lava Ita. It was a wonderful trip, uh, one that we're all still kind of coming down from and processing. We got in to Asheville. Most of us got into Asheville around midnight on, I guess, Friday morning, Thursday night. So we're still waking up and we're glad to be home. So thank you. Um, in that same vein, though, we do have prayer requests, and I have a very special request that I wanted to share with you for this young couple. Um, this is um, Kenny and Alejandra, and they got married in January of uh, 2022. Um, Alejandra is Colombian, and Kenny is Cuban. And because of that, they are physically separated right now, which is hard enough. But right after they got married, Alejandra became pregnant and um, Kenny tried desperately to get to her before the baby was born, was confident that he could. But um, the baby was born uh, on the 18th of October. Her name is Zoe Daniela. And um, he is just desperate to get to them. And um, we, I talked with him for a good while on Friday night uh, because he had tried to get his visa on the same day that we, he rode with us to Havana so that he could see if he could apply for the visa again and was turned down again. And his, his texts to me were so poignant. He, he said, I'm, I'm just very sad. I can't eat. 
I can't sleep. I only think of my wife and my baby and trying to get to them. And so I assured him that our church would be remembering him through this whole process until the visa arrives. And so I want to challenge you all to join us in prayer for this young, sweet family. You will have these um, pictures in your bulletin and your newsletter. Full disclosure, you have to open your newsletter to see them. <laughs> I am speaking to the choir because this whole group reads their newsletter. Um, but uh, their picture will be in the newsletter and I challenge you to print it out and put it somewhere to remind you or put these names somewhere to remind you so that we can join them in this struggle and, and lift them up. I also invite you to pray for our friends in Cuba who are struggling with all kinds of issues, predominantly inflation that is caused by lack of resources and other things. Um, but to just give you a quick example, they do a ministry of lunch, they prepare lunch for the senior adults in their community, and the lunch used to cost them a dollar to fix. And so they had enough that they could also feed the workers and the volunteers. They've had to cut out that part of feeding the workers and volunteers, because now what used to cost a dollar costs 15. And so it's that kind of thing that they're dealing with. And so I invite you to continue to pray for them and, um, and uh, put feet to your legs or, or at least uh, fingers, put feet to your legs. No, no, no. Hopefully that's already the case for us all. Um, put legs on your prayers. Thank you, sir. Hopefully your legs already have feet. If they don't, we'll be praying for that. All right, moving on. Um, you can uh, write your Congress people and ask them to have a heart for Cuba as well. There are links in our newsletter every week. We also pray for um, those who were at the funeral this week where there was a mass shooting and also those who were involved in that stampede in South Korea um, where so many were killed and others were injured. Um, there is pain everywhere. By grace, there is also mercy. And so let us step into the flow of that mercy as we go to God in prayer. Oh God, we thank you for the chance to worship freely. We thank you for this beautiful space that we have, for these friends who have gathered here. We thank you for the music and the technology for the comforts that we so often overlook. And we thank you for giving us fresh vision through our brothers and sisters in Cuba. Oh God, I pray that right this moment that you would lift up uh, the hearts of those who are struggling, whether they be in our sister church in La Vaita or in South Korea, I pray that you would strengthen the spirits of those who are lonely, whether they are young couples separated unnecessarily or senior adults struggling with housing. Oh God, you have called us to pray that your will would be done on this earth just as it is in heaven. And so I pray that you will show us how to be a part of your will prompt us into doing the work that you would have us to do. We pray, O oh God, that you would hear our heart cries. And even now we lift up those names to you asking, Lord, in your mercy. Nona. Nona Christensen. Kenny and Alejandra. Lord, in your mercy, 
Hear our prayer. And now let us pray as Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now please stand as we sing our second hymn, 25. number 25. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch's treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns His face away. When we traveled last week, I decided as my carry-on, like purse bag, that I would take our children's bag so that I could remember y'all and I could share with our people there that that's the bag I take every week. Um, but today it was full and I couldn't bring it back because <laughs> I haven't emptied it out yet. So I'm bringing, I brought a brand new bag that I just got this time. It is a, uh, this was made by Maria Victoria isn't that so cute? I, love it. I know it's very cute. Um, so uh, this is our our bag for today, um, and I will be uh, keeping a close eye on it, Jennifer. Apparently, I'm going to need to do that. I, I'm, just remember, coveting is one of the big ten. So throw that out there. All right. So today. I have a different kind of book in two ways. One, I didn't get the physical book, so it's on my Kindle, and so it looks like this. And two, um, it's on my Kindle. So um, you get to see the digital pages instead of the um, actual physical pages. So I hope those online can actually see the pictures, but I have a sense that they may not show up very well online. 
So if you are not where you can see these pictures, uh, please try to position yourself so that you can. That's another problem with digital. It's hard to see. Um, but the name of the book is, uh, that's as bright as I can make it. Sorry, folks. I don't know if maybe, hey, Rayuel, would you go turn off one of the lights overhead? I think that would probably help people to see a little bit better. Just one of them. Not both, just one. Um, that might help in the room for people to see because it's pretty. Yeah, that helps a lot, right? Thank you, Rayuel. We'll turn it back on after the book. <laughs> Did Martin Luther go on a diet of worms by Tai Vu? He drew the pictures and he or she, I'm not sure which it is. Um, this person drew the picture and wrote the story. Did Martin Luther go on a diet of worms? Did he eat them? Those mushy, squishy vermin covered with germs? Or was it something else? Read on and see if this diet of worms is what it appears to be. This baby is Martin Luther. He was born in Germany on November the 10th, 1483. His dad worked in mining. His mom had a kids in all. He easily excelled in school and in college, he studied law. One day on Luther's way home, a lightning bolt, bolt struck so closely that to St. Anna he cried, since he nearly died, that if he lived, a monk he would be. As a monk, he prayed and worked hard. He fasted and confessed. But then he would learn that God's love is not earned, but could be freely possessed. It was that blessed day when he read Romans chapter one, the righteous shall live by faith. Man is saved by grace alone. The church instead said differently and sent indulgences to sell. All you need is a coin or two to make a lost soul well. To dispute those foul practices in 1517, he hammered the 95 Theses to a church door on Halloween. The invention of the printing press dispersed the information. His writing went throughout Germany and sparked the Reformation. At the Diet of Worms, he was threatened punishment if he did not recant, but he could not go against conscience, conscience nor scripture, so he firmly held his stance. So you see, this diet was an assembly, and Worms was the city, where Luther would be called to defend the 95 Theses, all his treatises, and the rest of the works he had penned. He later wrote many hymns and the Bible he would also translate. Thankfully, history would show that as far as we know, there were never any worms on his plate. The end. We read this story about Martin Luther because today in church, it is Reformation Sunday. Um, it is a Sunday where we celebrate the event called the Reformation, which was started by Martin Luther, um, but continued by others. And because of Martin Luther, we get to remember uh, the work that they did to make us, our church, what it is today. Let us pray. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us a chance to know you better through the work of people like Martin Luther. We love you, Jesus. Amen. And now for another story, we will turn to Romans. Uh, that is not the right text. Romans 3, 19, I don't <coughs> Maybe it is, hold on, <laughs> sorry. Romans uh, 3, 19 is what I have on the bulletin. So we'll see if that's what I meant in just a second. Yes, <laughs> it is. 
<laughs> now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sights by deeds prescribed by the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested to the law and, and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I hope you noticed in that last sense, uh, it's a hymn, there was a phrase so I don't boast in anything except for Jesus Christ. Just want to point out, and you know, I know I do this a lot, but I don't think I can do it too much, how much I appreciate the work that Michael does to be sure that our music is in line with the theology of our, our text. So thank you again, Michael. And pay attention, because there just might be a clue in the hymns about what's coming next, creating prior learning, which is a good thing for everybody. Um, so, there are few things I enjoy more than family stories. I loved hearing the story about how my mother-in-law juggled her dates just so that she could see the movies that she wanted to see, <laughs> and how my parents met in a sign language class that my mother was teaching and my dad signed up for just so he could meet the cute girl he'd seen on campus. I love the story about the day of my father-in-law's brother's funeral when full-grown men, my father-in-law and his brothers and his nephews played baseball in the yard of the family home to celebrate the memory of the brother who had passed away. The sad stories or the funny ones, the the victories or the struggles, I love them all. Because hearing my family members tell stories helps me remember who I am and where I come from. And that is why the church decided to celebrate Reformation Sunday. It was a big debate because it's the only celebration in the church year that has nothing to do with a biblical story. All the other festivals, Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, Christ the King Sunday, which we will be celebrating in two weeks, um, all of these other things have to do with the, the biblical story, but not Reformation Sunday. And so there was a big debate because this is church history and why should we have a, a Sunday delegated to church history? Well, some of you know that my first in my first life, I was a history professor at Campbell University, and I love church history, so there is that. I'm not going to miss a chance. But the other thing is I do think it's so important for us to tell the stories of how we became who we are. And so I am on the side of the argument that says, yes, let's celebrate Reformation Sunday. Now, if you don't remember us doing this before, it's not because you didn't hang on to my every word, which I'm sure you did. Um, it's because I don't do this every single year. But I do like on occasion to lift up Reformation Sunday. But if we're going to talk about Reformation, we need to know two words. One is Reformation. Reformation comes from the word reform. 
which is made up of two words, re and form. Form means the shape of a thing. Re means again. So forming the thing again. And so reformation is taking something and reforming it. We do this with animals who have possibly been abused and have some behavior problems. We reform the animal. We may do this ourselves. We may be reformed through taking behaviors that are unhealthy and changing them into more healthy, better behaviors. That's what reformation is. It's taking something that exists and changing it, reforming it, into something new or better. Not getting rid of the old, but including the old and adding and changing and developing it in some way. So that is one of the words. But when we talk about the church's reformation, what did we reform? Well, we reformed the church. And at the time the Reformation occurred, there wasn't a Pentecostal church and a Lutheran church and a Baptist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Anglican, all these different churches. There was one church, the Catholic church. Now we think we've got Roman Catholic, we've got Greek Orthodox, we've got Egyptian Orthodox. We have all these different Catholic churches. Well, that happened later. At the time of the Reformation, there was one church. It was called the Catholic Church because Catholic means universal or unity. And so there were people who said there are problems with the way we do church and we need to make it better. That's what the Reformation meant. There's another word that we need to know, and that word is Protestant. Protestant is a word that we don't use today except for when we're talking about church. We talk about Protestant denominations, and what we mean by that is Episcopalian, Anglican, Pentecostal, um, Baptist, Methodist, whatever. Those are Protestant churches. Churches that are not Catholic are Protestant. So that's not the way the word started out. That's the way the word became used. It was initially the same word that we use today, protester. So the Protestants were protesters, just like contestants are people in the contest. Protestants, Protestants, were people in the protest. An important thing to remember as we proceed through this, because there were protesters who wanted to reform. Keep in mind, the Protestants, the protesters, did not want to get rid of the Catholic Church. That was not their goal. They wanted to reform it, make it better. And in the process, some people thought, okay, this is good. We've done it now. And they remained in the Catholic Church. But then there were others who said, mm, you haven't gone far enough. And they became what are called separatists. They left the church and reformed a new church. And that's how we got Lutherans first. So today we're going to we're going to talk about the reformation. We're really we're talking about the beginning of it. Now understand, when we mark a point of beginning, even like if you mark your birthday, there were months before your birthday that you existed. People just couldn't see you yet. Right? The moments before you were born that you were in process and those are those moments matter but you celebrate your birthday and the moments before the reformation mattered because there were people making sacrifices and presenting arguments and talking about these things and they led up to what martin luther did who was the first protester to kick off the revolution later there would be people like john calvin and Henry VIII, who had some very selfish reasons for changing the church, but I'll let y'all look into that on your own. Um, yeah, heads rolled. Uh, but anyway, Martin Luther is the one we're going to look at because he was the first one. And that's why I read the story that I read to the children and for all of us to be reminded of who Martin Luther was. 
Okay. If we're going to talk about the Reformation and the Protestants in light of Martin Luther, there's one more word we have to know, and that word is penance. Penance means it, it comes, it's, uh, it's the root word of the word repent. We think of repent, we say repent a lot. I'm going to repent of my sins. Penance is the things you do, are the things you do. <coughs> to reach that forgiveness. And the Catholic Church taught that you could do a whole lot of things to get forgiveness. And Martin Luther was, I will say, probably had some form of obsessive compulsive disorder because he could not believe he was saved. And so he confessed over and over and over again. He could not stop it thinking about the ways he sinned. <coughs> He confessed so much about his sin that his priests finally started giving him work to do so that he would leave him alone because he had other people who he needed to attend to. But Martin Luther was taking up all of his time because he couldn't stop confessing of sin. Part of this was because Martin Luther was a theology teacher and he had gotten it in his head that the reason um, that 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 Forgiveness came through confession. And the more you confess, the more you were forgiven. That's one of those formulas, by the way, that seems true, but isn't. Well, um, Martin Luther um, began to practice all kinds of penance in, in addition to confessing. He, he wore hair shirts, which were these scratchy shirts that they wore under their clothing so that he would constantly be reminded of his sin. <laughs> I, yeah, I think I would, if I don't know about y'all, but I think I'd be like, I'm good. I'm good. I've confessed enough. I ain't thinking to wear no ha hair shirt up under my clothes. But anyway, Martin Luther felt like that was something he could do. And he uh, participated in a whole lot of practices that we would find abhorrent today, disgusting today. Um, but eventually, his job was changed and, and, and he was changed from a theology professor to a professor of the Bible. That means he stopped talking about what the Bible means and started talking about the Bible. That change was made in part because <laughs> the priest wanted him to shut up about all of his sin. They wanted to get him thinking in a different way. Now, Martin Luther was not the only one who was worried about getting rid of the sin in his life. The Catholic Church was too. Now, I tend to think that they started out with good intentions. They wanted people to be able to achieve forgiveness, but they took it too far. <coughs> and it became a kind of uh, contest to see who could get the most forgiveness. They created all kinds of ways that you could get forgiveness. You could go, well, I won't get it, there were all different ways, but one of the ways that was most destructive was called indulgences. And you could purchase an indulgence with gold coin that would um, get you out of your sin. So let's just say that you forgot to say your blessing over your food. You would go to the priest and you would give the priest a coin and then you would say a certain number of prayers and the priest would hand you a certificate that said that you were forgiven. And <coughs> that was bad enough. But over time, they began to sell indulgences for the sins of people who were already dead. And so you would say, you know, Uncle Bobby, he really dipped into the bottle a little bit and I need to cover his sins. So I'm gonna give you uh, this much money. If you'll, he can't say the prayers, I'll say them for him and that will get him out of, that'll give him a get out of hell free card, kind of. Well, 
you can see, right, how this would get pretty twisted. If, if it had stopped there, I don't know if Martin Luther would have been reformed or not, but it didn't stop there. What happened was Pope Leo decided he needed a new cathedral. And he thought, what we need to do is up the sale of the indulgences and collect more coins so that we can build this cathedral. But the problem was the Pope was the richest person around. He had plenty of money to build the cathedral. He just didn't want to spend that money. <laughs> he wanted to spend somebody else's. Fair point. So he divides up Germany, where Martin Luther lived, into separate sections and puts a different person in charge of each section. And they have to make a certain amount of money to build the cathedral. And the person in charge of Martin Luther's was Friar Tetzel. And he was one of the worst of all of the indulgence salespeople there was. So think of the sort of caricature of a car salesman, a used car salesman. That, that was Friar Tetzel. Now here's something you may not know about Martin Luther. He was a foul mouthed sucker of a guy. And he did not like Friar Tetzel. And so he would insult him, and there are records of his insults. Here's, here's, just, here's just a few. Um, this is Martin Luther about Friar Tetzel. Are you not making an elephant out of a fly? What a wonder worker. In other words, what magic? You're taking this little tiny problem and turning it into an elephant. Here's another one. You are like... Well, let's see. May God punish you, I say, you shameless, barefaced, liar, devil's mouthpiece who dares to spit out before God, before all the angels, before the dear son, before all the world, your devil's filth. Here's another one. You are like hogs wallowing forever with their noses in the dung hill. Martin Luther did not play. Side note. You can go online and Google Martin Luther insult generator. <laughs> and you can hit refresh over and over again. And you too can be insulted by Martin Luther in this very day. Um, challenge for you. So Martin Luther and Tetzel went sort of head to head on these issues. And so Martin Luther wrote out his ideas about this because by now, He's been studying the Bible and he's learned, wait a minute, I missed it. I was wrong. Points for self-awareness. I was wrong. We're not saved by what we do. We're saved by who we are. And who we are is children of God, beloved and full of grace and mercy. And so there's nothing we can do to gain forgiveness. And there's everything we can do to gain, gain forgiveness because we already are beloved and forgiven. We don't have to do anything. Folks, that's good news. To remember that we are saved by grace. Because we do it too. We have our indulgences too. They're not certificates, but we do the same thing. We, we think a thing to bits. Anybody else got focused on yourself and all the things that you, where you've missed it? Have you ever thought to yourself, got busy thinking about all the sins in your life and got stuck thinking, I can never be enough? I can never be enough. I could never teach Sunday school. I could never be a part of a church because I'm not enough. That's indulgences. And I love that term because we indulge ourselves in thinking about our own sin. And if that's not enough, we start talking about it and we start confessing to everybody to see what their reaction will be, to see if, if, if they will still love us, if they know, if they really know. We keep over and over again trying to pay for our sin when Jesus is going, hey, I'm right here. <laughs> Turn and, and look at me. Finally, possibly because Martin Luther studied scripture, he got the message. He got the message that in fact, grace comes not through what you do, but because of who you are. 
He also said that you should read the Bible for yourself, that you should get to God, to know God on your own, that you don't need a priest to take you there. Amen. And yes, you do need somebody else in your life. Do not get so stuck inside your own head. That's what drove Martin Luther nearly crazy anyway. When you read scripture, read scripture in community. Read scripture on your own and read scripture in community. Because that's one place where Martin Luther missed it. He thought if you could just, if you just stayed in the Bible right by yourself, you could reach this level of holiness that was greater. <coughs> but we know through Jesus Christ example, that we know God better when we're together. Martin Luther was so relieved to learn that, oh my gosh, I don't have to do any of this stuff. I can just come before God. That he's known as saying, here I am, here I stand. I can do no other. His example is one for us. It's a human example. Remember that, that perfect human, not Martin Luther. He was, he had a nasty little mouth and he wasn't very nice to his wife. And there's a whole lot of other stuff about Martin Luther. But he does give us an example of standing before God and saying, here I am, love me, love me just like I am. Let us pray. <laughs> Oh God, the weight of our own sin keeps us awake at night and holds us at a distance from your love. Forgive us for indulging ourselves. Oh God, we ask that you would remind us again and again and again that we are yours and we are enough and we are loved. We ask this in the sweet name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever. Amen. It's about 24 hours ago, I asked Michael, maybe it was 48 hours ago, but not much, well, I don't think so, it's probably more like 24. I said, hey, you know, Reformation Sunday, think we could sing a mighty fortress is our God. And as per usual, that is what we're going to sing. It's not in our hymnal. Hopefully you know it. It is a hymn that was written by Martin Luther in 1529. A mighty there fortress. Copies over there. Thank I'll you. pass out some copies to everybody else here. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Now, two quick things. The language in this hymn may be a little tricky. And so I invite you to read it over again because it's kind of poetry and it needs um, reflection. I just wanted to point out a couple of things that in the song. Um, first of all, a bulwark, I found out when I was the sign language person for a church, is a wall, a fortress, a, uh, a, a barrier. Um, and so Martin Luther is saying, our God is strong. He's like, he's like a wall that can't be broken into. Um, our God is our helper amid the flood. Um, no, none, of, uh, none of our mortal problems can overcome God. Um, whenever he talks about the ancient foe, he means uh, Satan. Uh, he says our, our ancient foe is trying to do us in, but his, and his craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. There's nobody like him on earth, but uh, in God, he is tumbled with a, uh, one little word shall fail him. Um, so thank you again for this beautiful hymn. Do review it. Um, a second thing I wanted to share with you, you may have noticed that I've added something to my uh, vestments today. This cross was a gift from Kim and Stan to <clears throat> me and Sela and Annabelle, who are the pastors of the sister church. And we committed to wear these on Sundays in another way to connect us to each other uh, every Sunday. And so this cross um, represents the unity of our churches. And I'm grateful for the chance to add that to my Sunday vestments. Most importantly, church, remember, no matter what you've done, no matter what you will do, no matter what you are doing right now, you are loved. And there is nothing you can do about it. Thanks be to God for this time of worship. We'll see you next week. Thanks for being with Ecclesia.